background. Okay. It's specific. Hey, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks for jump, uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, in fact, this is I know this is between the lunch and the rest of things. So taking the time and coming here is really appreciated. So one of the key <coughs> topics that we have been covering the digital side for most of the days, but today's topic for what we want to cover is that on ushering a new era for manufacturing to through digital transformation. One of the this morning also we had the keynote speakers talking about what the digital maturity, how we are looking at from an organization standpoint. So today we have a esteemed panel with us. So we'll cover through the topics, and then at the end of it, we'll find some time to see <coughs> seek your questions and see if we can get a response out of that. So what today we have Rodney, just quickly on Rodney Durand. He is the vice president for digital manufacturing services uh, from LNT Technology Services. Then we have Ralph Rio, who's a VP from ARC. You know him. He has been there for long, so. <laughs> is no need of no big introduction. And we have Bobby Wainwright. He is from Indorama Ventures. Uh, he is part of the asset manager for uh, Indorama Ventures. So they will be answering most of the questions. We will run through a bit of a polling and also to run through few questions as we mix between polling and this. so we seek your inputs as we go along to find out what the what you feel about the certain how the industry is going, what your organization is up to and all in the digital journey. So that we'll get through as we go along this particular process. So quickly on LNT technology services, we are part of a billion dollar enterprise. We are, around, uh, we are a billion dollar enterprise, part of a $23 billion uh, conglomerate. Our focus is to uh, looking at from an engineering, we are an engineering organization, purely from product development all the way to the manufacturing and after services. So more, dealing with product development, how to manufacture, setting up factory lines and everything. And one of the key aspects we is that we have around 1,000 kind of patents that we developed, which is co-authored with customers. Customer owns mo most of the patents, but we co-author with them as part of their product development cycles and manufacturing. And we, we have our own services patents that we created out of some of those where we can repeat it and use it for other customers. So as we are going through the, um, uh, we just wanted to have from your perspective who you represent. So just take quick polling questions and you can pick up one of those where what who you represent as end users, our OEMs, service providers and others. So you can use the, what uh, have the QR code and the QR code will help you in terms of identifying. So you can take that. So we, Way cool. so it's good to see that uh, there's a lot of end users, manufacturers. I know it's it's a dynamic at this point of time, but still it looks really that's majority of them. So part of the one that so we are, our focus is to get this inputs and frame our questions towards something on the end users and manufacturers. And the second one that we want is how big is your organization? So we wanted to understand how we are viewing, what is your digital journey and everything associated with that. So this, could we have a lot of $10 billion enterprises then? And okay, that's a good, I think a healthy $10 billion and a billion dollar plus organizations. Nice to hear that, that we have large enterprises joining us that today. So from, a, from the understanding, what one we wanted to do is one of the areas that we'll start a quick polling in terms of what is the stage of your digital maturity. So this is something that will set the stage for us as well. What is your digital maturity from your organization of manufacturing operations? What do you see it? Where you are in that particular roadmap? I know this morning we saw there is a 15 to 20 percent who hasn't started, and then the remaining 40 percent have already started on the digital journey in various forms. I see that's kind of a representation looks more or less here. Hmm. So, I think I think everyone has we have seen there is a 30, 40 percent as we are seeing here also that the smart factories and initiatives everyone is looking at and how much of that 
looking through what are the challenges. We'll come across some of those questions. How do we do the challenges as you're going through, through the digital journey? Maybe the next. So what we want to have from, uh, what we wanted to get a question is to see that COVID has changed a lot of things within the, within the manufacturing and the digital side of it. So from Ralph, from your perspective, how has the real impact of digital adoption, COVID and post-COVID, what do you see from your perspective? Oh, COVID, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, COVID got us, uh, I want to say, partway on the path. You know, the, the, with COVID, people had to work remotely. So there was a lot of digital transformation for remote work, uh, which is a good thing. But to me, that is just a small step because uh, digital transformation involves uh, business processes and adopting those technologies to either automate or uh, add flexibility or improve the, the current uh, business processes we have that, that operate the company. And, and uh, I feel strongly we need to move that at a next step where uh, we take this good beginning and move to the next step where for a digital transformation of our business processes that run our, our companies. Thank you. Al. So in terms of looking at taking this as further, one of the things we have seen in the industry uh, post-COVID and uh, post-COVID is to see that and during COVID what we've seen is the manufacturing resiliency, so what are your reliability and all those things from a supply chain de-risking. So, and the trend that we are seeing, there is a lot of nearshoring coming in. So Rodney, from your perspective, what is that? The nearshoring, is it that pushing the digital index much more adoption? So what do you see from your side? Yes, thank you for the question. So what we definitely are seeing is, you know, there's a big initiative right now that's called reshoring. Um, and it's reshoring.org that, that anybody can, can join and see where it talks about what, what are the main drivers. And what we're seeing is that it's not really to cost. Now, of course, as, as a consulting firm, we, we offer that we will do things uh, either cost neutral or cost positive, meaning we could bring stuff back to the US, produce it here at a lesser cost, right? That's the main goal. Um, the reasons behind it is, is actually not to secure supply, so that's the driver, the main driver, is, is to secure supply, but actually recovering that core capabilities. So those are the areas that I see that most people are really focusing on. I see. And I think that the trend that we've seen, uh, others also mentioned that fact is the critical material shortages, everything coming across, labor, um, uh, what is the inflation, labor shortages. This also also some of these things also driving some of this digital journey that we're seeing as Roddy was mentioning. The fact is we are seeing that, so some of these organizations today with the panel that we have, so Bobby, what do you see from the standpoint that looking at what are your considerations, because you are on a digital journey, and what are the three considerations, if you think is the one that you are going for the digital adoption, and what are the challenges that you are also seeing, and what are the success factors? Maybe too many questions there, but <laughs> I'll just see that we can frame it across. Um, so I'd say first, I guess, developing your vision and strategy are very important and setting smart goals. Um, also important is change management and culture. So it's very difficult to change the culture of your organization. And then developing a centralized data hub um, is very important so that you can access data and get out of silos. <clears throat> as far as challenges, um, I think a lot of it is adoption where we have, um, I think that's our biggest problem is getting users to engage regularly with the platform or whatever solution that we're offering and then getting them to fully adopt that solution. I see. And how do you measure in terms of success? Where do you see that in terms of uh, in the initial part of your journey? Um, so success, I guess it's measured in, um, I guess we kind of look at two main buckets. So you have uh, operational efficiency and then uh, redeployment of human intellect is the other. And, um, really, when you look at it, at the end of the day, it's really about um, achieving results to the business, um, affecting the bottom line, and so that's what we're going after, even though we know there's a lot of uh, soft or intangible benefits, um, like employee satisfaction. Excellent. So one that we have seen during the, uh, the COVID, post-COVID, 
and also taking that. The other piece is COVID drove certain things. So looking at from the market standpoint, what uh, Ralph, what do you think is the is that environment which pushes the digital transformation? Because when you do that, the, when the demand is high, market is doing well, okay. is this the time for digital transformation? Or when the market is down now, everyone is talking about a slowdown and everything. <laughs> is this the right time for a digital transformation where there's a capital and then capital is required to do the transformation? Yeah, I, 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 think, uh, I think digital transformation is highly important in both situations. Uh, the focus will be different. Certainly when business is not good, uh, there's concern about cost control and, and there's opportunities to improve business processes with digital transformation that reduce costs and improve operational efficiency. Um, when, when business is really good, then we need to look at increasing capacity. Usually there's limited resources. Nowadays it's, it's tough hiring talent. You know, last week, uh, what was it, 3.4% unemployment rate? Uh, so how do you increase capacity with uh, when you're not able to hire people? That's digital transformation again. Uh, so I think it's important in both. Now, uh, increasing revenue tends to get the attention of the C-suite uh, and is easier to justify because it increases revenue and they, they like that. It certainly improves the P&L statement and the balance sheet. Uh, but cost reduction is also important. And uh, that tends to be more operational, and the uh, uh, the uh, operational VPs will will get behind that kind of uh, uh, improvement. And so, you know, those are the kinds of in in the different situations. You also have different champions. Is Absolutely. my point. Absolutely. So, from what is uh, Bobby? Then, what you your take on this? How your organization is viewing now that you you are also seeing that the markets changing conditions and things like that. So how do you view from your organizations what the priorities looks like? Um, so um, I thought that was a good answer that you had. <laughs> the, uh, so when you have a bullish market, you have a lot more money available. <clears throat> and so you can do more tactical experiments. And so by doing more, um, implementing more technologies, you have a higher chance of success that they will pan out. Uh, whereas in a bearish market, um, there's less uh, less capital available. So there's less of those. Uh, proof of concepts that you're able to implement. Um, but you have to be a lot more focused in which initiatives you go after. And so it really pushes you to strategize uh, to make your biggest impact with the least amount of resources. Perfect. Yep, absolutely. And now with the one on the polling questions that you want to see that the next question that one of the challenges that we're seeing that the organization structure that we have, I think, the, from a digital technology standpoint, what is that do you drive from the challenges that you see from an organization to take that and then adopt it much faster? So is that, because most of the cases from our experience also to see that from, is to see that two things came out from, one is the process changes, other one is organization culture, which I think Bobby was talking about. So that's something that is a biggest challenge is for them to adopt some of these technologies. And I see that the same thing that the polling also reflects that. It's good to see that. OK. So what we have is from the, from the key technologies what we have from a transformation services. What are the key technologies that you think, Ralph? are the ones that are driving the transformation. So what do you believe would be the ones that pushing, pushing for the... <laughs> I know there's today this talk about chat GPT and all these things yeah. coming into that. Everybody has their favorite technology, don't they? Yeah, yeah. and a champion for it, it seems. Um, if we were having this conversation 10 years ago um, and prior, uh, it seemed that there would be one major technology occurring at a time, one being introduced and, and stuff like that. But uh, in the past few years, and, and uh, certainly going forward, uh, there's multiple technologies going on at the same time. And you know, it isn't uh, just one, it's maybe a dozen going on at the same time. So I, uh, uh, we are in a hugely dynamic situation compared to 
to history in terms of technology change. Uh, so it, I, I can't choose one that you should pick. I, I think you need to look at your application, look at your business process, and I'm a, I'm a champion of, uh, of uh, value stream mapping that comes out of the lean, lean manufacturing. Uh, world, and you know, before the people in the process industries start thinking I'm incompetent, why am I bringing that up to, to you? I'll just point out that in in uh, 1954, Toyota was attempting to make their first 100 cars in a month, and they failed uh, initially. Uh, and now, you know, it's a good time, a long time later, but now they are the number one manufacturer worldwide. So. Before you diss lean manufacturing, think about the success of Toyota. And I, and I think you, you involve the people who are involved in the business process. Those people understand it the best. And you map out the business process and you plug in technologies that improve that business process, whatever they may be, and not champion a particular technology. Absolutely. I agree with you. And I said, Bobby, that taking that in terms of from the journey that you had, what Ralph was talking about, the technologies and this, has, how has your roadmap and prioritization has changed over the time that you see that is this more from, you see that movement in the roadmap or is it more of a static that you have seen from, from your organization? What do you um, so the roadmap, <clears throat> so initially we focused on uh, implementing some big win projects. So <clears throat> we would do some um, focus on large processes that are very complex and apply um, some different tactics like machine learning or advanced process controls. But then over time, we've come to notice that uh, we have a lot of difficulty giving remote uh, support to different sites. And so we've been working on our data infrastructure and having a cloud based data hub such that we can pull information from a lot of different sites and then apply analytics and, uh, and then visualization techniques to it. Absolutely. So I think that's the same thing for Ronnie, that you're seeing that from the industry that you're looking at. Now how from you've been on this uh, services side to look at how has the, what do you say, technology changes to stay competitive? Have the, the evolution of like what we talked about, AI, ML, everyone talking about how they are gone about cloud, IoT, GPT, and all these things, the technology changes are so rapid. So how does the landscape changes? What do you believe would be the roadmap going forward that we look? So I, I want to piggyback on something that Ralph said. I think before we used to run a manufacturing site, it was by site, right? And we would put, we would have places, and we had our production was, was moving. And you can see when there was movement, right? So, so it was all about site. And because we didn't have digital, right? So, so here we are 30 years, 50 years later, and, and now we have all these items that can work. When, when, when you can replace with automation or autonomous, it's, it's really, they're really not autonomous. They're just being very well programmed, right? Um, but if, if you're able to maximize the use of our most valuable asset, which is our people, right? The people is really our major asset. If we can replace tedious work, which is what we're trying to do all the time, right? We can get product moved from, from location A to location B, but we actually know what it is. We know the codes, we know what it is, what. So, so it's that facility that you want to move towards so that you can actually create that easy environment where people are doing things that are important. And I'm, one last topic on, on people. You know, McKenzie actually published something a few months ago where they're projecting that there's going to be a shortage of 1.3 million workers by 2030. So if that doesn't wake up anybody, you know, what is it? We have to be able to run facilities that are extremely efficient. And the only way to do it, in my view, is to digital transformation, right? So that all the people are running up with a sheet and checking things, so that doesn't make any sense. We, we can't have that anymore. So that's, that's why. Thank I you. So we have another polling questions that we want to run it. So from the, so we have seen that we have been discussing about the transformation digital. One of the key areas that we wanted to at least get your views is that 
what is the right, I know there is no right or wrong, but the fact is what is the organization structure for a digital transformation? Because a lot of them have gone CDO, CTO, CIO, all these different uh, uh, roles. How has been yours and what do you feel as your views on it? Because this is something that we have been, who runs the digital transformation? Which organization within that, uh, from how it has been? So I see that the one is the need for clarity. I know there is multiple roles that they have, and is there a clarity that is required? And also there is two different functions. The run function or the concept creators function. Is that the role that we are seeing? And in some cases, that is there a confusion that? So this is something that we wanted, we've been hearing from a lot of folks are saying, what is your thoughts, how the organization looks like, and helps, is helping you in that? So I see that this is like the CIO, CDOs should have a different roles, advanced manufacturing. That's good. And also need some clarity on that front too. So on this front, I think the, so this, this morning also we had the discussion talking about it, a digital transformation brings the flexibility and process improvements and operational efficiency. We touched on it a few here as well. How do you see that from your perspective? How has that enabled, so a lot of these things have been, it'll help, but how has it helped customers to achieve that? And the other key things is also sustainability coming into the manufacturing side of it. So what is that, the digital transformation helping the sustainability? Everyone wants to have an ESM side of it, what the story is on as we go through this smart manufacturing. Uh, who's that for? That's for Ralph here, yeah, sorry. Oh, this for yeah. me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I wish I was paying attention. <laughs> uh, I actually, I'm gonna build off of what Rodney said about uh, manual processes. We, we mentioned manual processes in paper. And um, I'm starting to feel that paper is evil. And we need to look at paper as being uh, uh, the bane of manufacturing or any business process because paper slows up business processes and is the source of uh, a lot of data entry errors. And uh, which, you know, if you don't have good data in your system, your system isn't going to run well, whatever that system be. So um, I'm going to get back to lean a little bit again. Uh, I remember having a, a conversation with a sensei for uh, a lean. Now these, these were these uh, uh, people who would go into a manufacturing site, walk through the site, tell people where they're screwing up and start changing the process immediately. And I asked the guy, you know, how do you know where to start? You know, why, why did you pick that spot out? And he said, well, it was simple. It was the place with the tallest pile of inventory. And I think we need to do that with uh, business processes and paper. Now, do a gimbal walk equivalent through your facility, find the big, tallest stack of paper, you know, metaphorically, and that is where you start your value stream mapping and process improvement to get rid of that paper. It is evil. Amen, yeah, <laughs> exactly. We all agree on that. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I think, uh, thanks uh, Ibrahim for joining us. Ibrahim is the Director for Digital Manufacturing so uh, on Selenis Corporation. So I know you had, you're going through a large digital transformation as part of your organization initiatives. So how do you measure your success of the information? So one of the key things earlier we were talking about the digital transformation, we touched on it a few things again, is the, how do you are measuring your, uh, is it successful, how it is going? And is it something that is leading towards that alignment of strategies, uh, uh, objectives that the corporation is going through the different turns in the, uh, what do you say, in the market conditions? How do you see that from your side? Sorry. Yeah, so our, our digital transformation strategy at Salonese is, is very much an enabler of our business vision, right? 
Um, the way the way we we looked at the digital transformation strategy was okay. If you look out like ten to twenty years out out in you know uh, from a time perspective, what do we really want to do as we grow up as a manufacturing uh, organization and as our manufacturing plans for the future? What does that look like, and how does that enable our business objectives uh, as we're going down that ten to fifteen or twenty years down the road? And then really work backwards in understanding, okay, what is the right digital operating model that I need to support that? What capabilities do I need in terms of interactions with people, process data, and technology to, to, to enable that, right? Um, and then the question we ask ourselves is, what is that value proposition? What is that worth to us in terms of the business drivers and how the digital is enabling that and what is the return on that? from a holistic perspective, right? And then we start thinking about where are some of the foundational pillars and capabilities do, what do we need to support a roadmap for that vision, right? So have a roadmap, what are the foundational capabilities that we need, things like data, you know, connectivity, you know, and, and then really understanding, because I talked about the operating model is building a, a design and solutioning and capability around what I call the human-centered design, uh, around the people. Right, one of the things that, that we, we've seen that people run into is with a lot of technology focus. And when a company wakes up and says, hey, I want to do digital transformation, you're just surrounded by a lot of vendors that want to sell you stuff, right? And then there's the other aspect, extreme of that is you know, going down the data lane and trying to solve world hunger on data. But for us, it's really around, let's talk about a strategy and a roadmap that is focused around people, Right? How do we empower, optimize, inspire these people to become more effective and efficient with the right data, with the right digital processes, with the right tools uh, to enable them? Right, Because at the end of the day, whatever value proposition you put on your digital transformation strategy, it will only come through the, by the people for using the things that we deploy. And what we don't want to end up in is create more inefficiencies in the processes by creating clunky architectures, clunky digital tools that don't work, that don't integrate, don't allow data to move together to have seamless processes, right? Um, and, and more often than not, sometimes what happens is your job is much faster just by picking a piece of paper than working in 10, 20 different tools to do run your day, day job, right? So having a solution design that's built around humans uh, that enables the, 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 the processes that we want and the value we want, um, and, 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 and tying that to the business drivers that, that your company might have. And that's how we, we have designed our strategy. Thanks, sir. So, Ralph, that, taking that from this, from your experience, what do you see that customers, companies view success? And we had seen in the past that the POC paralysis, people do that in the digital journey and then drop off and things like that. So what do you view as the part of the digital journey pushing this a, a, what do you call the ongoing basis of the measuring success and seeing that? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm going to bridge off the uh, one of your polling questions about, uh, you know, what's what's a justification? You know, um, I think the top the thing was the business case, case yeah. right, uh, as being an issue with these programs, and uh, it needs to be a business case that appeals to the C-suite. And um, the C-suite, you know, their metrics are out in the open. It's a P&L statement and a balance sheet. Um, and I, I, if you can't make a business case that connects to that, the C-suite metrics, then uh, you're not gonna get their attention. That means you're not gonna get the resources you need to do the project very well. Um, and you're also going to have a tough time uh, getting your peers or the people you need to influence to get on board. Uh, you may say that's an the uh, cultural issues, but I would rather argue that uh, it's a lack of management of change. You, 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 you can't state the problem in a way that a lot of people want to get on board, and usually that's the business case. So. Uh, I think the key thing is a business case that affects the P&L statement, which means it's got to, for the most part, affect revenue, because that gets the C-suite's attention. Um, and and uh, it could be increases in capacity. It, it could be uh, greater uh, 
customer satisfaction because you can ship on time, et cetera. You know, there's a lot, of, I see a lot of justifications that are based on reducing cost. And yeah, they also increase revenue, but the engineer is not comfortable talking about a revenue increase. Um, they're more comfortable talking about the cost reduction. And I think it's necessary for the engineer to get out of that comfort zone and talk about the broader business impact, particularly revenue. And when you do that, that totally changes the, the uh, executive support that you can get because they all love revenue. And uh, uh, the access to, because they're on board, you get more resources. You know, people complain about, well, I can't get resources from IT. Well, if you had a good business case that got the C-suite's attention, you would get all the damn IT resources you want, all right? That would not be a problem anymore. So I, I think it's really important to focus on a business case that appeals to the C-suite. Excellent. I think just to one on follow up on this, some of these on the business case side of it, how much of it would the foundational activities, which sometimes the business case gets mm -hmm. killed because a lot of effort has to be turn around to get to the 20th century or maybe a little better. That effort, how do you factor that into the business case? Yeah, yeah. I'll take that hit because there's some things that we've um, started to think like a ut utility, meaning uh, you know, we don't do a business case for every wall outlet, outlet in, a, in a new plant, for example. Uh, uh, and a few years ago, Wi-Fi was not considered a utility. So the first project that needed the Wi-Fi needed to justify, you know, putting Wi-Fi in the entire plant, which was obviously a huge hurdle. We are starting, I think the more enlightened people are starting to realize that Wi-Fi is a utility uh, and will then facilitate a lot of other improvements. So around the things that are, for lack of a better term, utilities, um, I think maybe that's where we need IT to, to enlighten executives and, and just, just put it in, just do it, for example. I agree. So I think we'll go to a couple of polling questions that, oh, okay. So I'll just miss that, oh, one of the, I think maybe, maybe we'll do the next ones. Then. So he'll, no, we'll take this one. So one of the high priorities that, what is your high priority in the digitalization that you are looking at? Because as, as Ralph was mentioning, there's a lot of priorities in the digitization. So it's not a one a earlier days of the ERP or an I2 or a supply chain or solutions like that. And that was the drive for this, but now it is multiple things. So what do you think as the priorities that you see in your organization? I think we see most of the cases that we have seen, the culmination comes into the data analytics and everything, but there is a lot of back end, back end work has to come in. This morning when the keynote speaker was talking about, we're saying, hey, this is the tip of the iceberg where the dashboards and everything is what you look, but below that you have ton of work that needs to go in to get to the dashboard, to the real time data and everything. I think there's a lot of these. And the other one is touched on the robotics and automation because of the labor shortages, what we see, how do we get that to overcome? I think we see the same thing in here. That's good to see that. See the next one. So the other thing is from the smart technologies. We touched on it, fuse the adoption issues, change management and everything. But we also wanted to have is something which is accelerating because in spite of the change management, there is a lot of effort between what you see as the adopting reasons the market is, is market driven or is internal driven and how do you see that? Most of it is market driven, but I see there is a huge on the operational agility, supply chain de-risking and okay. optimization of operations. So I think that the fact is we're seeing the cost take on operations being, becoming one of those things that everyone is an organization is looking at and I think that's also the reflecting of the polls to see that it's as we expand the capacity, it should we be more optimized in the manufacturing rather than having a, a, I want double the capacity, but I don't want to have reinvent, double the investment. 
maybe one and a half times or less than 50% to get the double the output that is looking at the market. So on the next one, we just want to touch on this, the next uh, polling, if you can move there. So the other, uh, next one, maybe we can pull that because of time. Uh, one on the sustainability that we wanted to see that, how big is the sustainability criteria in your organization? If you move to the next polling, that question. Further, uh, okay, next forward. Okay, so one is that how much is sustainability in, in your ma manufacturing operations? Because a smart manufacturing we are looking at, most of them want to digitize it, but sustainability is one of those areas. We talked about paper, we talked about all of these things, falls under the budget, under the sustainability route. So where do you see that? Yeah, it looks like it's a huge on no clear strategy. There is a collecting data from manufacturing lines. I think that we have seen our, the experience from what we wanted to have based on this polling questions, what you have. So sustainability, Rodney, from what we're seeing is a big deal in a lot of these organizations from services we are looking at. And for the Fortune 500 companies, how is that from is sustainability integrated to the to achieve the goals from your experiences? I think it's at a very infant state. I think a lot of us are aware of it. Um, still, it's not really a driver. I, I think in some instances it is. Um, the ones that are, it really depends on the manufacturing industry you're talking about, right? So, you know, I can't talk about oil and gas and say, oh, they don't care. That's absolutely a false statement, right? But when you talk about medical devices, when you talk about you know, industrial products that, you know, com consumer products, it's different. So it's, it's really a mixed bag of things. Um, it, I, I, don't, I don't see it as a driver still, right? So I think everybody knows the importance of it and perhaps countries are more focused. Uh, you know, I don't wanna bash any country here, but the, I, I believe, you know, we're, we're all aware. I, I think the state of awareness is there. I think it's gonna take a few more generations to really make this part of it, right? My kids think like that. They, they, oh, wait, they, they only do reusable, they only, so. I think that generation is now gonna start really to embrace this. Okay. So I think coming to the, uh, uh, from a digital journey, so this is something that we see uh, as there is an adoption, clear strategy is not there like what we've seen. There are people who, are, uh, all the customers, companies are collecting data from the wages and seeing that how they can baseline it and their 2020, 2050, 2030 goals that we can align it. And there are a lot more incentives that we see in the market and the government incentives, which is pushing some of those things that from a, uh, a, a energy and sustainability side. Mm -hmm. So from Ibrahim, from your side that you're looking at, you are seeing uh, multiple service companies. What do you think as what play that LTTS as a service company that can bring in into the, what is called digitization in the new age of manufacturing? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, the key role uh, the companies that are helping us like LTTS is also in establishing a strong data foundation for us, right? So we talked about solution design, human-centered design. At the end of the day, if you can work that backwards, what we really need is the right data for the right person in the right context and at the right place, anytime, anywhere, right? And in order to get that, um, if we can partner with service providers that can really help us start building a journey on prepping, cleaning, establishing good data foundation. Uh, for us, it also starts with even like engineering systems, like engineering drawings, your design data, your asset data, your if you have 3D models, getting that all in the right space, in the right context, making sure that that's all connected up so that it can be leveraged in your manufacturing facilities to make better and faster efficient decision making. And to me, that that is the, the nut you can crack to to get to the vision that you want. Oh, thank you. And so, Bobby, what do you think as such as services companies can help in the manufacturing? Uh, so I think they play a very important role, too, just based on the number of resources we have. Uh, these external providers can provide a lot you can't do internally, but 
Um, I agree with what he had said, but I also just want to point to, we have this large entity within our company that's our Lean Six Sigma department. And so they're some of the masters of change management and they're embedded within the organization. So they have black belts, green belts throughout the organization and they implement projects. They're really good at, at uh, making process improvements and controlling those changes. And so to me, it's important um, and talking about what Ralph had said, you know, going back to the value stream map, uh, it's very critical to use a lot of those fundamental tools to optimize processes and then determine where you need to focus your efforts. And if you don't know where you can make the biggest impact on the value stream, then the odds are you're implementing your technologies in the wrong direction. And so to me, it's, it's very important to get the fundamentals right before just implementing technologies. And so leveraging internal departments like that can be very important to your digital transformation strategy as well. Thank you. Excellent. So coming to the end of it, so Ralph, this is something that leading question to see that. What do you see a manufacturing looks like in 2030? I, I know the earlier session was on industrial metaverse and everything, how it is coming in. What do you see from overall from by 2020, what the manufacturing looks like? <laughs> Digital transformation helps. Asking me to forecast out seven years in this day and age is just crazy. I mean, that's seven years, that's, uh, let me count, them. one, two, I think that's five iterations of Moore's Law, just to do the math, that's two times two is four, times two is eight, times two is 16, and 32. Yeah, yeah. You know, I can't forecast out that long. Um, uh, one thing I know for sure is you're gonna need flexibility. Um, you know, it used to be that black swans occurred once every five, seven years. Now black swans seem to be occurring once a quarter. So uh, I, forecast out seven years is, is, is tough and I'm gonna emphasize, um, you need flexible, that's also from the viewpoint of your technologies and infrastructure and applications, but you need flexibility also from the viewpoint of the balance sheet. Uh, in that uh, you've got some assets set aside, so if things go badly, I should say if, when things go badly, you got the resources to recover. Um, uh, now there is one, you know, I'll just give you another example. We've got some technologies like quantum computer computing coming up, um, which is superb for simulation, not for things that digital computers are very good at, but for simulation. So. You know, it could very well be that seven years from now, um, I'll take, you know, like weather modeling. It'll, it'll be superb for that. So it, it's very likely that seven years from now, you'll be uh, uh, having an event in your backyard. Everybody will get a buzz on their equivalent of a cell phone at that time. And they'll go inside, it'll rain. Uh, and uh, the, the host has already got figured, knows when it's gonna stop raining. and. Uh, you know, you go back outside at then, it has a event. So it's the simulation and forecasting are going to be at that kind of level. So um, your what if analysis for your business can take on whole new types of de dimensions. And you can prepare uh, for that, that need for flexibility uh, much better than you can today. So. Uh, Right off, I'm going to say it's going to be a completely different world. It's going to be fun. Uh, hold on to your seat and go. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Raj. Thank, thank you, panel, for, the, uh, for joining us. And thank you, audience, for this listening in. Uh, maybe I can take one question. Is that something that you have? Yeah. All right. OK. So sorry about that. We, we are outside, panelists outside, that we can have one-on-one -on -one sessions if you want to have any questions. Thanks you. Thank you for joining in.